Good evening. Sorry about the delay. We had a little trouble with the, with the restaurant. Who was Malcolm X? A man who has a three-hour movie made of his life? A man who has the entire nation in a frenzy to get an X hat, X t-shirt, X shoes, X socks, X bumper stickers, bumper stickers, et cetera, et cetera. But after all the hype is over, let us not forget the man who caused all this hype, the black man whose name alone struck fear in white people's hearts, the black man who at the time when most blacks were bowing down, he stood up. We must remember the man. What better way to remember the man than to listen to someone who knew him? Benjamin Kareem served as first assistant minister to Malcolm S. as Moss at Moss Number no. Seven during the 1960s. He worked side by side with Malcolm until that fateful day in 1965. He's going to share with us a Malcolm the general public rarely viewed, a teacher who spoke more of obedience, moderation, and peace than of violence. The editor of the book *The End of White World Supremacy*, which is a collection of speeches by Malcolm X, and also the author of *Remembering*. Malcolm. I'm pleased to introduce you to Benjamin, Benjamin Kareem. Ah, boy. Well, as Muslims say, Salaamu Alaikum. In other words, it means peace be unto you. And I'm sure everybody desires peace. But let me first tell you something about this restaurant. We were sitting in the restaurant, right? I hadn't, haven't eaten since last, last evening. And this morning, my wife said, eat breakfast. But I had worked out. I said, I'm not hungry. So I got to O'Hara Airport. I went to get something to eat. And uh, hot dogs were $3.50. A little slice of pizza was $5. So when I got to a restaurant here, I ordered um, tomato soup. And uh, what do you call it? Uh, onion rings. So this lady, she brought this little thing that I thought was my tomato soup and onion rings. And I ate it. I said, wow, this, this tomato soup is spicy. And what it was, I come to find out, then she brings me another little thing there. She said, this is your tomato soup. So I said, well, what was this that I just finished eating? She said, that's the sauce <laughs> for the onion rings. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I was, I feel, I feel okay now though. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, the um, sister, sister that introduced me was correct. I, I did open the meeting for Malcolm X the uh, the day that he was killed which was about 27 years ago, the 21st of this month, February. Um, how many of you saw the movie, number one? Wow, that's good. The, uh, the movie was very authentic. Uh, in the, the dance and all of that, uh, back in those days, people danced that way without going to dancing school. Uh, the, uh, the actor that played Baines, there was no such person as Baines, but he was a composite of all of those people that had come against Malcolm. Uh, this prison scene of meeting Baines in prison 
is not how Malcolm was introduced to Islam, his brother Reginald, but um, rather, I guess, Spike, rather than using um, many different actors, he just used one uh, actor as a uh, composite figure. The uh, scene at the police station was good, was exact. And <clears throat> that was the uh, incident in Harlem that brought Malcolm X into focus. It's when uh, this young man by the name of Johnson was brutalized by the police in Harlem in 1957. And at that time, the uh, African Americans, uh, men in Harlem, weren't allowed to even congregate on the sidewalk. Any <clears throat> more than three people were dispersed. So you could say at that time, Harlem was uh, under uh, paramilitary occupation force, so to speak. And there was no such thing of anyone going to, any African American going to the police precinct and demanding anything or protesting. And no one had ever, well, someone, but in general, we knew nothing about Malcolm X in Harlem in 1957. And any, anybody in Harlem in 1957 that was worth knowing, we knew them. But this man, first he went to the uh, police precinct and demanded to see Johnson, his brother, Johnson, who was a Muslim. And the police denied that they even had anyone there by that name. So he left. And uh, when he came back, there were about, there's some Muslims had come in from Philadelphia, uh, New Haven, um, surrounding cities. But still, there weren't more than about 100. But by the time he got to the uh, precinct, there were thousands of people, thousands of young people that had begun to march with this man called Malcolm X to the police precinct. And when he went in this time, uh, he told the police officer to look out the window. And when he looked out of the uh, window, that's when they changed their mind. And they took this man to Sydenham Hospital. And uh, a uh, neurosurgeon by the name of Dr. Matthews, who was also a mortician. I mean, if he couldn't save you, then he had, he could bury you. <laughs> and he was very active in the civil rights movement at that time. But anyway, uh, by the time they got uh, Johnson to Sydenham Hospital, half the New York police force had come out. And these Muslims, this was when he was with the Nation of Islam, began to encircle groups of police officers. Now that's unheard of. And Malcolm told the deputy police commissioner that if that man dies, I'm not responsible for what happens to those police officers that are in those circles. So in the interim, Dr. Matthews came out and told him the man would live. And uh, a plate was, was uh, inserted in his uh, head. Uh, and he told Malcolm had he gotten him there 15 minutes earlier. He couldn't have saved his life. And <clears throat> what Malcolm did, he raised his hands 
he lowered his hands and thousands of people that knew nothing about this man just vanished quietly. And the uh, deputy police commissioner did say that no man should have that much power. That was true. Uh, D uh, Denzel um, his script was almost verbatim of what Malcolm actually said. When Denzel Washington in August, we were with him <clears throat> in New York, Spike Lee and the other stars that were playing in the, in the, uh, in the film, in the movie, and they were to begin the next month, which was September. And Denzel Washington had listened to every tape, every record that he could hear, news uh, from news media, that he could see and hear Malcolm speak. He read his autobiography. He talked to people like myself and other people, excuse me, who knew him personally. And at that time, uh, Malcolm ate one meal a day. And Denzel Washington began eating one meal a day. And Spike Lee said uh, a few months ago, you know when, they, when you, they film and then they say, cut, little gadget. He said at one time, Denzel Washington told him that he did not remember a thing that he had said. And that's how uh, he had taken on the spirit of Malcolm X. And when they flashed to black and white uh, to portray uh, Malcolm when he came back from uh, making Hodge, and coming back from Africa, <clears throat> you know, I had to look twice myself to distinguish whether that was Malcolm or Denzel Washington. And uh, I think that each and every one of you should, uh, should see that movie. It's an excellent movie. And also, it portrays the part and the influence that Mr. Muhammad had upon Malcolm. And it's impossible to understand him in his beginning without understanding the part that Elijah Muhammad played in shaping Minister Malcolm's life. And I was with him for eight years. At that time, as a member of what was known then <clears throat> as the Nation of Islam. But I hope that each and every one of you uh, will go and see it. Oh, and the, uh, the song that was being played, sung by Sam Cooke, when uh, he was on his way to the uh, Audubon Ballroom, it was Malcolm X, believe it or not, that influenced Sam Cooke to write that song. A change will come. And how do we know it? Because at the premiere, Sam Cooke's father, who is a reverend, he told us that it was Malcolm X that influenced him to write the song, A Change Will Come. So hopefully uh, each and every one of you will go and see this movie. And since <clears throat> this is uh, Black History Month, and I guess you could say to us it's somewhat of a, of a sacred month. I think it began as Black History Day, then Black History Week, then Black History Month. But um, when, when we say black history, uh, that's a term that has to be qualified. Because black history or history is intertwined. Let me tell you what I mean. At, at, at some point on this earth, we know the human being did not exist. And any of you who are Christians, Muslims, or Buddhists, or Hindu, 
or, or Indian or whatever you are, all the legends and the scriptures speak of a time when a human being did not exist on this earth. Then <clears throat> at some point, somehow, the human being appeared on this earth. It means that that human being or those two people had to have been created or evolved someplace. And that the uh, anthropologists have come to a conclusion that the beginning of the human being began along the equator on the continent that you and I today call Africa. We also know at some point from those two people came all the other people that exist today on this earth. If there were two people, then these two people, either they were colorless or they had color, since we live in a world that's so caught up in color and nobody likes to talk about it. It means they, they, they must have had, they had to have some color. If not, then they would have just remain water. So if they had some color, then we can assume as anthropologists and the archaeologists can assume that these two people were black. Black, black. When we say black, we mean black. And from these two black people came all the other colors, came all the other races on this earth. We had nothing to do with that, absolutely nothing. And if I may recite um, a verse in, in the Quran and in some of your scriptures, it says, Says, O oh mankind, surely we have created you from water, from two people. And in one point it said, black mud, and have made you tribes and families that you may know one another. At some point on this earth, the human being began to develop a language. We're speaking of the human being. Whether those two people were as, as smoothly designed as we are, or whether those two people were quote unquote crudely designed as they have shown us in some of the skeletons that they have found of the human being as the human being existed millions of years ago. But we do know that perhaps millions of years later, the same upright creatures appeared in other parts of the world, speaking different languages. At some point, we know that there were no people in Japan because they have histories and that, that go so far back that they are mythological legends. The people of Samoa and those islands, they know at, one, at some point their ancestors migrated from somewhere to those islands. The people in Europe, they know at some point there were no people in Europe. 
So at some time in the annals of history, the human being migrated and appeared in Europe. But none of these people can tell you, the Chinese, the African, the Caucasian, the Indian here, and they found evidence that the Indians had been here over 30,000 years. But at some point in the annals of time, that Indian came from somewhere else. So what our legends and our myths and our scriptures tell us that the human being developed and was created or evolved, however your persuasion is, in one place. And those human beings would have to have been black. Black, blacker than any human being that now exists on this earth in order for the other colors to evolve. Because we know that the color black is really not a color. When I say black, I mean black. It's the sum total of all colors. If you look at black mud on a microscope, you won't see black. You see all the other colors. Also, we know that on this continent that evidently the human being evolved. And those people are the forefathers of all of us. And those people, we had nothing to do or no part that we played in their creation and their evolution or even our own existence. So on this continent, perhaps millions of years later, arose a civilization. A civilization that the Greeks, later on, thousands and thousands of years later, they called the civilization Egyptus which we call Egypt. And this civilization that we call Egypt is a civilization that borrowed nothing from any other civilization. No language, they borrowed no medicine, they borrowed no architecture, they borrowed no style of garment. They borrowed nothing. There has never been, and this is the mystery, and it has nothing to do with us. It has to do with those people. This is the mystery of that civilization. That at one point, the continent of Africa on that continent was the center of world civilization on that continent. There has never been a civilization that existed on this earth that borrowed nothing. There may have been civilizations that, create, that predated that one, but that's the one that has come down to us through an annals of history intact. China borrowed. The Chaldeans borrowed. The Hittites, the Sumerians, the Sumerians. Our civilization here, matter of fact, everything that we have here was borrowed except jazz. Jazz is the only culture, it's true, that was created here in this country. Nothing else, ballet, no dance form, nothing. Calendar, Egypt did not borrow the calendar. The Egyptians originated their own calendar. From these people, and not only that, they ruled 
a great empire that stretched all the way into what today we call Syria. And as time went on, as every civilization has done, they declined. As one civilization declines for whatever reason, another one rises. As they declined, then there were some other dark-skinned people. When you say black history, it's, it's, you know, you, you have to, it's a tricky, it's a tricky thing. If you say black history, then you're talking about the Dravidians of India. I mean, Africa is not the only place in this world, spot on ge geographical area, where black people have lived and do live and have built civilization. Uh, if you just think of one continent or one place, then you, you have to broaden your scope. You know, it's like you say, Asian civilization. I mean, Asian civilization covers more than Japan, China. You're talking about Malaysia, Cambodia, Thailand, Central Asia. You know. So about 2000 BC, some other dark-skinned people crossed the Mediterranean. And they found some people in Europe that were somewhat barbaric, without culture. Uh, when, you, when, you, when you have no culture, you are barbaric, barbaric. You're not savage, because the people that we call savages, they have culture. They have traditions. They have myths. They have legends. They have religion, but we're talking about a barbaric people. And these people here have nothing to do with those people. In those days, there was no such thing as people considering each other's color. That came after the Moors were driven out of Spain. The Portuguese started that thing. But anyway, the Greeks, and they went into Europe, and these people civilized these barbaric people. And behind this civilization came a great civilization that we call the Greek civilization. The Greeks called these dark-skinned people Phoenicians. The Greek word phonicus, it means sound. It also means the, a, a thing that's the color of clay, a dark color. And they took into Europe the alphabet. They introduced them to architecture. They introduced them to culture and refinement. And I don't know whether after, sometimes after you come in and you, and you, you help people and they wind up killing you, so nobody knows what happened to the, uh, the Phoenicians that were there in Europe. And the Greek civilization rose. And the Greeks came closer than any other civilization in the Western world till this day to create a perfect democracy. The Greeks gave uh, much credit to Egypt for the, 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 the knowledge that, that they had uh, acquired in medicine. Uh, even the clothes that they wore, you can see, came from across the togas. It was not a European garment. And they created a beautiful civilization that has not been equal in terms of culture and civilization since that time. And they got weak, and they began to argue, and they began to fight the Peloponnesian Wars, and that civilization declined. And when they declined, Europe went into a somewhat of a dark age 
and then some other dark-skinned people cross the uh, Mediterranean, and they found some people, the Italic tribes, and they brought civilization to these people. See, when you say civilization, not just to say, hey, somebody did this, you want to know what contribution was made to the progress of civilization. And these people that today we call Etruscans, they civilized some people that later developed what is called in history, Rome, that developed into what was called the Roman Empire. And these were people that came from across the Mediterranean into Europe. And then the Romans, they, they were mighty. And after a, a time when they became rich with luxury, they began to become soft. And the men began to complain about the young people and how uh, un, un, uh, unmindful they had become. They began to complain about women taking birth control to prevent themselves from having children. They began to complain about the same thing that we are complaining, complaining about now, how unsafe it is. You can't leave your doors open. You have to look over your shoulders. And that civilization fell. And for a thousand years, there was no civilization in Europe except the church that kept the writing going, that, that began to write books, the monks. And in 711, after Islam had spread across Africa, there were some people that crossed the Straits of Gibraltar that's, that were called the Moors at the invitation of King Theodorus because the Gothic tribe, the people that today we call Germans, had uh, taken over. And they, had, they were oppressing the Jews that were living in Spain at that time, they were very cruel people. So these Moors, these Moors, 10,000 of them cross the uh, Straits of Gibraltar and they conquered the Gothic tribes and they ran them out of, of Spain and they set up, built a civilization that lasted from 711 until 1492. And during this era, these men that crossed from what we call Morocco, North Africa, into Europe, they passed on to Europe optics, without which there would have been no Galileo. They, they passed on medicine. Ibn Sina's theses on medicine was used in Europe until the 17th, 18th century, 17th century. They called him, in your books, they called him Averroes. His name is Ibn Sina. Ibn Rashid, another uh, uh, medicine man. Oxford University was created out of the sciences that the Moors had passed on to Europe through Spain. The Arabic numerical <laughs> system was passed into Europe by these men that crossed into, into uh, Spain and stayed 700 years. And there's not one instance that any woman, they took no women, was ever raped. There was no pillage. These men were cultured. You talk about culture, your culture, your black culture, your white culture. These men were cultured. 
These men were refined. These men had respect for themselves. And at the same time, they were great warriors. During that era, if I may say this, and this is no insult to anyone, because we had nothing to do with those people. They, they thought quite differently than we do now. At that time, no one thought they were superior because of a color. People were superior according to their deeds, your honor, your courage, your valor. That made you superior. And it's still the same now. You know, if you don't have that, then, then, then we're all inferior. And Seville, there was, uh, at this time, and show you how people advance. At this time, in Spain, in certain parts of Europe, if you took a bath, you were put to death. You were put, this is history, you were put to death to show you how far civilization has advanced. That, that has nothing to do with people, with these people today. It has something to do with those people in that day. And there was a nun, it was a book by a white writer. His name is uh, Lamb. Huh? Uh, Harold Lamb, not Harold, Harold Lamb wrote uh, the uh, Crusades. Anyway, the name of the book is The Moors in Spain. And uh, he's an Englishman. Stanley Lane. Stanley Lane Poole. Get that, Stanley Lane Poole. And this nun was bragging that the only time that water had ever, had ever touched the tip of her fingers was in time for, uh, what do you call it in the church when they sprinkle water? Yeah, that was the only time. And these men built 700 bathhouses in the city of Seville, Spain, and they introduced hygiene into Europe. They set up universities. No one paid to come to those universities, uh, universities to learn. Uh, the same year that Columbus discovered America, the last of these Moors were driven out of Spain. And behind that, the astrolabe, the, the uh, instrument that's used for navigation was introduced into Europe by these men. Geography was introduced into Europe by these men. A more correct geography than some of the uh, Europeans had, uh, uh, what do you call it, cartography? Yeah. After these Moors were driven out of Europe, then the, 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 the uh, Portuguese were the first to sail the seas. Behind the Portuguese came the English. Behind the English came the French. And behind that came the slave trade. So up until that point, the, 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 if you say black, you, you may get the wrong impression. But the non-white people of Africa, and there are people in Africa that are as light as anyone in Europe, but the Africans had ruled. See, every, every people have had the opportunity to rule. And this has happened throughout history. So when we uh, uh, celebrate 
Black History Month, we have to look back and see what are the contributions that people of our race, so to speak, contributed to world civilization. And we can't look back and say, oh, we, went, we, we, we took such and such a thing up into Europe. There were people of our race that built the pyramids. So you can go to sleep. Not only we can, you have whites that can go to sleep bragging about what they contributed to civilization. High technology, which happened. And then what happened? The Japanese came on the scene. And the Japanese created a technology that overshadowed the technology of this society. So now, we in America are trying to wake up to say, how can we get this house back in order again? How can America again become an economic power? How can we uh, create jobs? How did Japan get ahead of us? You know why? Because culture teaches you. It gives you the flexibility to change. And unless you have the flexibility to change, you're a stagnated person or a stagnated country. If you're fixed or I'm fixed in my ways, in my ideas. And I said, because it's summer, I'm on the beach with my bathing suit on. And then the season began to change. And you say, hey, Kareem, it's getting chilly. I said, no, man, forget it. You know, I'm going to hang just like this. And then winter sets in. And I'm so fixed in my ways that I refuse to change no matter what's happening with the environment, I'm going to remain the way I am. And then about the middle of January, I'm standing there in a block of ice, frozen, because I did not have the flexibility to change. And that's what's wrong with this country. And this is what Malcolm used to talk about. He taught us about all of these civilizations. I mean, even further back than what we're going into now. But it's the ability to change. And many of you know that from the newsreel, the television, the newspapers, FBI reports, that nobody ever thought that Minister Malcolm would ever say, I never thought it, and I was with the man for seven years, eight years, seven years as his assistant. He was only, he only uh, lived 11 months after he left the Nation of Islam. And all of us were shocked when he wrote a letter back to us that I have made the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, and I met white people with the eyes, the bluest of blue, hair, the blondest of blonde, that had no consciousness of racism. And I tell you something. We, we uh, at that time, you know, we were all sort of, uh, you know, we couldn't see that. I mean, you got dogs down here biting these people, the young college students, the police in the South arresting these girls, spreading their legs open, beating them between their legs with belt buckles, water hose, two, three hundred pounds of pressure, ripping people's clothes off, 
black people being murdered, buses set on fire by white men. It's no way in the world that he could have gone somewhere unless, as we said, Malcolm is, he's gone, man. He's, you know, he's nuts. <laughs> you know, he's, he's sold out. But that wasn't true. That wasn't true. What it was is that when he left this country, he found out that he discovered, say, that white America did not reflect the whole white race. That the thinking of white America did not reflect the thinking of all white people on this earth. And by many of us not uh, being at liberty to travel, it, we couldn't see that. Only those who travel, there's an old Moorish proverb that says that one who never traveled will never know men. So if you never travel, then you and I may uh, uh, remain in a very narrow concept of life. But Malcolm had the ability to change his mind. Because once you come into contact with reality, and reality is that which exists, and our ideas concerning it has no effect on it. In other words, if we saw a car coming at 60 miles an hour and the man doesn't have any brakes and we were standing in the middle of the street until he left here. See, this wasn't your era. It was that era. But he changed. So what does that tell us? That's why I say we should, all of us should see that movie because we all struggle with something. Some of us struggle to prevent ourselves from committing suicide because we don't have the heart and we don't have the a culture and we don't have a discipline that will allow us to understand that failure only allows us to know what does not work. But we say, no, I'm going to kill myself because I failed. I'm going to kill myself because of this problem or that problem. That's a weakness. And this is why those people that have a discipline, that have uh, not necessarily family values, but have the value of family. And if you don't have the value of family, you have yourself. And there will never be another you. There will never be another you on this earth. And you can travel from here and you can look into the faces of every human being on this earth. You will not find another you, nor would you even find one person that have your fingerprints. So you're a valuable person. And when a person realizes his or her value, then they realize that I must develop the ability and the flexibility to change in order to adapt to those things that are changing around me. And I didn't want to speak too much on Malcolm because I find that every time we do this, then someone, when we finish, there's a thousand questions. So I usually just leave that for questions because I don't know what any of you may want to know. But one thing I can say is that we people here in America 
really need to change. You know, we really need to change. We ne really need to adapt ourselves to a global mentality today. Number one, if you don't learn a foreign language, you're restricted. If you think that the United States is an isolated country and what happens somewhere else does not affect us, then I would say with all of your learning, you're ignorant. If you say, what the heck, I don't need to learn anyone else's language, Perhaps you don't, but you may graduate and you may not get a job here in this country. But suppose you can change, suppose you say, hey, I can change my mind. Hey, give me a passport. I want to travel. Where, where do you want to go? Well, I learned to speak Japanese. I learned to speak Chinese. I learned to speak French. I learned to speak the Malaysian language. I learned Indonesian, or I learn Arabic. You leave here with a profession and a skill that you can offer somebody in this world. They may not be able to pay you money, but many of these countries have resources. They have gems. Pepsi-Cola is not paid money in Russia. They bought it. Pepsi-Cola takes vodka. And Pepsi-Cola brings the vodka here and they sell vodka for U.S. dollars. So you, there's always the first, the first exchange was bartering, not money. So learn a language. I tell any of you, learn a language. Because ignorant people have never developed civilization. Ignorant people have never liberated themselves out of their ignorance. Ignorant people are dangerous. And like Malcolm said, that ignorance is worse than poverty. Because once you enlighten a man or a woman, they can raise themselves out of their condition if they have the discipline to do it. So are there any questions? Okay, are there about Malcolm or anything? Nothing? No questions? Oh. Most controversial. Yeah. Contra uh, uh, you mean in reality or or or, <coughs> or or something or or some speech the media may have said was. Um, All right, I I I tell you the one that uh, that he made in uh, at uh, the Manhattan Center in New York in December the first, nineteen. 63, when uh, after President Kennedy was assassinated, um, some woman in the audience, uh, well, let me tell you what happened. Mr. Muhammad had sent out, I guess you could say, an edict, edict that no one should speak out against the dead president. He don't want any Muslim ministers 
to speak out against President Kennedy. He said, because black people in this country love President Kennedy, and he did not want to turn black people against Muslims. So we had, uh, Mr. Muhammad was supposed to speak at the uh, Manhattan Center on the first, and we had put out literature and had uh, pamphlets, and people were, you know, had been riled up. They wanted to hear Mr. Muhammad speak there in Harlem, I mean, in, uh, Man at the Manhattan Center. So he canceled it. Then Malcolm called and asked if he could speak in this place which he did. And some woman asked Malcolm, what did he think about the death of President Kennedy? And Malcolm said that it was a sign of the chickens coming home to roost. And to show you how almost everything he said was misconstrued, even this thing about any means necessary, I haven't heard anybody ever break that down as to what the man actually meant when he said that. So behind this, he was suspended as minister uh, spokesman for the Nation of Islam. And three months later, he, he officially split. But I think that was uh, the uh, most controversial one-line statement that, that he had uh, Made all his speeches public, publicly seem to have been controversial, where, where the news media was concerned. What, what did he mean in your, in your opinion? Of what? About what? What did he say? Oh, chicken. Oh, no, he explained that. No, he said that. He, he said that. Uh, he said that that America had such a, a wicked history and the way that people had been treated, the Indians, the black people in this country, you have to realize this is 1963. I mean, still segregation in this country. He said that, that had created so much hatred that it had culminated in an American citizen assassinating his own president. You know, you know, there was a saying that he used to recite, if I can remember it. He said that of all our studies, history is most attractive and best qualified for all research for it develops the springs and motives of human action and, predict, and predicts the consequences of circumstances that act so profoundly on the destiny of all human beings. So what he was saying was that, that the hatred in this country had culminated in Amer an American citizen assassinating his own president. That's what he said he meant by that. And it wasn't some kind of a uh, mockery about uh, President Kennedy being assassinated, but it was just misconstrued, you know. Huh? A documentary. A documentary. Oh, Yusuf Shah, yeah. Captain Joe, yeah. What about him? He said Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad were heading down the Muslim community. And he went away from that. That Malcolm and Miss Muhammad was heading down the collision road. Collision road. Um, yes, but it was not of their own making. It, there, there were people around Ms. Muhammad at that time that had become very much afraid of Malcolm X. 
I'm talking about in the Nation of Islam officials around Mr. Muhammad. And he was, he was ill, he had bronchitis. And they were afraid, they were afraid. Matter of fact, the, the, the body of Muslims did not even believe Mr. Muhammad could die. And that's the truth. But the officials hardly ever believed the higher up as the masses of people believe. In the church, out the church, in government or out government. And they knew if Mr. Muhammad had passed at that time, the possibility that Malcolm would have become the number one leader of the nation of Islam. And they knew had that happened, that heads would have rolled. So it was important that they maneuvered him because you're dealing with a lot of millions and millions of dollars. And where you have millions and millions of dollars, you have power. And where you have power, you have corruption. So, uh, and, and the, it, yes, they were on a collision co uh, a course because of people feeding Mr. Muhammad the wrong information about Minister Malcolm. Let me tell you something, when he, when he was killed, he could have been a wealthy man had he wanted the material world. Had, had, had he not chose to dedicate his life to, for justice, to try to help African American people, he could have been wealthy. When he was killed, he had $150. That's all he had in the world. He never even had a bank account. The car that he was driving, the Oldsmobile, before he got that car, he had an old rundown Chevrolet. And Malcolm used to run up and down the road from one place to another, uh, talking to people, setting up mosques, or at that time setting up temples, trying to enlighten people. And he, he, he would drive fast, but he would always, he told us when we travel like that, put a Bible on the dashboard, that we were stopped by the police to say that, we we're preachers, we we're going to a prayer meeting. And he said, police don't give preachers tickets, you know. And, and, and so Ms. Muhammad told him to buy, said Malcolm, buy yourself a car. You know, the, 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 take the money and buy yourself a car. And he wouldn't do it. He said, he was talking to us, he said the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm not going to buy a car is because I don't want the other ministers to become jealous of me. So what happened, uh, that same Captain Joseph and Brother Maceo back there before all this other stuff took place went out and bought that car that Malcolm had when he was assassinated. About a week or so before that, we were coming from the Teresa Hotel, and he had gone to the insurance company to, tr to try to insure his life because he had nothing to leave his family, nothing. Like I said, not even a bank account, nothing. And even, even the, the clothes that he had was burned up in the house that was set on fire. And that same thing happened to his parents, his father and his mother, when he was a kid. This was a little before this had happened. And we were walking down from the Teresa Hotel there on 125th and 7th Avenue, and it had been snowing. And uh, he had this trench coat, and he used to wear galoshes, you know, that had these, these uh, what do you call it, with the snaps? Latches. And, and uh, he, would, he would leave about three of them unlatched, you know. He'd walk them through and, and these things are clinging. And he'd say, you know, I just came from the insurance company to try to get life insurance. And he said, they would not insure my life because I was too much of a hazard. And he said, that shows you, that tells you how much my life is worth. See? But, I mean, that's the de kind of dedication that he had for people. And there's a saying, say, your service 
to humanity is the rent that you pay for your space here on this earth. And he paid his rent. He paid his rent. And two of those people that killed him are dead. One of them that was shot is the only one that went to prison that was involved in his assassination. Four of them never went to prison. Two of the four are dead. The other two are still here. And I guarantee you that they regret that they killed him. You can't solve problems by killing people. You create problems. <laughs> That's it. Okay.